what we're going to be doing this evening, just introducing, you know, what you've gotten yourself into, what the, the training is going to be covering, uh, a little bit of history uh, around the kits and the curricula, you know, who's been involved in developing it. Anything. So who are you listening to? Well, again, this is Matt Llewellyn here, and I am the uh, co-founder of Cybody, as well as the typical instructor right now for our hands-on course that we do live uh, using the Industrial Edition, which is what this course is based on using the Cybody Works Mini Kits. Um, at Cybody, uh, we have now been working for about five years, uh, really never anticipated building any type of uh, hands-on laboratory environment. Uh, or building out our laboratory uh, that we have now that we use for testing and research uh, for industrial applications and cybersecurity. Never planned on doing that. Basically just planned on building training, uh, education, and use some existing uh, portable environment. And, and that is where things fell short quite quickly that I uh, then realized that that environment didn't exist. So uh, we began uh, building out, trying to figure out ways to uh, make it easier to learn hands-on. And in doing so, we ended up spending uh, quite a bit of the money that uh, I had uh, uh, received from selling my consulting company uh, called Incari. Uh, sold it to their co-founder and took a little bit over a million dollars and built out, and it wasn't all at once, uh, never thought we were going to spend all that money, uh, but built out our control system cybersecurity lab. So what's happened from that? Well. We wanted to find uh, categorically, I wanted to find, and then it moved to we, but wanted to find categorically uh, certain vulnerabilities within ICS devices just to um, discuss them, right? They weren't publicly as publicly accessible or aware of you know, what kind of vulnerabilities were within the equipment or within the protocols, and I really set out to try to find some of those vulnerabilities just so that we can use them educationally. Uh, the first one we did uh, was one uh, which was a vulnerability in engineering workstation software and some Rockwell uh, Allen Bradley equipment and an inexpensive controller called the MicroLogix uh, line. And that's one of the two published industrial control system cert notices that are in the courseware today. Uh, but ultimately, that's what I was trying to do is we were trying to do is find vulnerabilities that we can then discuss categorically so that you can be thinking about how you need to mitigate them. Further, uh, when I had my consulting company, we ran into a lot of challenges, uh, literally in boardroom discussions or with legal teams or even some of the engineers, where they just rejected the risk uh, that it even existed. And I was like, you know what, we have got to have a platform that can show some of this risk or it's just going to get rejected over and over again. And so that really is what led me to sell that consulting company. Luckily, the other co-founder went to buy it. And then I started on this path, hey, give me a platform. It didn't exist. We had to build it. And we built the lab and then ultimately being able to identify a lot of these vulnerabilities. And, and the intent all the time has just been to identify different types of vulnerabilities so we can then use them in the curriculum to then also identify how we want to go and mitigate them. So now, uh, you know, we've tracked uh, our industrial equipment, the real equipment, really around the globe. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of that uh, individually, you know, where I'm carting around 14, 15, 16 gigantic Pelican cases, 50 pounds each of equipment, or 75 pounds each of equipment. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that gets pretty intensive as you're trying to manage that, and it doesn't scale well. So that's where we move to uh, building these mini kits out, which you now have in your possession uh, with the traffic light model and the Raspberry Pi. But what's pretty cool is we've been able to take uh, a lot of the same vulnerabilities that exist inside the real equipment and really virtualize it inside that small platform. So, you know, literally, uh, I feel like you're getting a little bit over a million dollar lab in your hands in that nice small piece of equipment. And, and I think you'll, you'll maybe you will We'll understand that even more, again, as we go through the laboratory environments and you're able to see how we're able to do some really cool things that are in there using software-defined networking and, and talk through some of the exploits and mitigating controls. And we already have pre-configured SNORT with quick draw rules, which are, are rules that allow you to uh, investigate certain types of industrial protocol traffic. So there's a lot of really neat things in there that uh, are going to be pretty exciting, I think, to work with. So our, our agenda for this evening, a uh, high level one, is to talk about what the evolution of this kit is, you know, what, what you've gotten yourself into, uh, and then we'll talk about those online lectures, the course book, workbook, and you know, really where everything's at. So the kit itself, as I was saying, uh, it allows us to do a lot of really neat things. Uh, you're going to start uh, in section one where you're going to build a control environment. 
you know, literally, uh, you are going to be building out, uh, you know, not sophisticated. We, we have some of the sophisticated models already in place, but we will have you build out um, tags. We're going to have you build out some ladder logic, some functional logic. Uh, we're going to have you set up the industrial protocol, and you're going to have working at the end of section one um, a, a small little control environment. You will have built part of it, uh, and then you're going to load in the logic that we already have pre-built. So, you know, you are going to build that control environment, and then we're going to get to the model where you're going to break things, and then we'll get into actually how you secure it. So the, the philosophy is build, break, secure. You know, and, and we do it uh, using uh, the techniques of, of reverse engineering. So what we'll do is we'll have you build an environment, and then we'll add to it, and then you have, a, have actually have you reverse it to figure out how what was added into it. And it'll, it seems to, to work much better educationally to use that model. So, you know, the, the CyberWorks platform itself, you have the mini kits. Uh, we have then combined with that certain missions that we, we use for you to go and achieve certain skills, whether it's to, to learn and discover uh, uh, network components and what's actually running in an environment. You know, that's, that's one thing that we still deal with in a lot of different facilities uh, where they just don't know what runs their plant. They don't know what's running their industrial facility. So how do you go and find it, right? And, and guess what? It's not a, it's not some magic piece of software. Although we've tried, uh, and it is included in this platform as well. You know, tools that you can use uh, to passively analyze environments. But a lot of it is, you know, feet hitting the ground and actively discussing with other people and doing physical walkthroughs. And we talked through that process. So, you know, we have you go through a mission, and in fact, we added in on second section two a black box scenario where literally you're trying to discover what's out there uh, using some different tools and techniques. Of course, we have our courseware that you're going to be using. Uh, you know, it is tailored for the mini kit. Uh, we do have it also tailored for the industrial edition, uh, which is using the live controllers. And, and really, we only offer that uh, in a live, uh, hands-on, you know, five-day environment uh, versus what we're doing online now. So it's a little bit different model. But you get all the same benefits in this course. Uh, it's just whether you had you know, specific things you were dealing with uh, for a Rockwell, for a Siemens, for a GE. You know, if you had specific outcomes you were wanting uh, for that platform, uh, that's what you would get from that industrial edition. We also have Kinetic Models, which, of course, the model you have is the traffic light intersection. That's that printed circuit board that's inside the mini kit. And it, it's a fantastic model to use to truly get your hands around what a control system is. You know, the, the traffic light is a, a ubiquitous model. Everybody really knows what they are. But maybe you haven't really thought through the I.O., the inputs and outputs, the physical I.O. that's there from the green, yellow, and, you know, red lights. You know, I mean, that's a little bit more obvious. But what about the momentary push buttons that are in place for the pedestrian crosswalks? Or, again, the illumination for the pedestrian crosswalks? Or what about what's actually in the physical roadway uh, as a pressure pad or a sensor or a, uh, some kind of electromagnet, you know, a magnetic sensor that's there? an electromagnet, but a magnetic sensor to be able to sense, um, you know, that there is uh, pressure or weight or some kind of magnetic um, uh, component that's resting on it to know that maybe these traffic lights should be operated in a different manner than just a timing sequence. Uh, a red light camera, and then all of a sudden the communication pathways that be established for that, or a whole set of traffic lights that work together and collectively, or rush hour and, and typical hour traffic systems. I mean, all of that, that's what we really like about that traffic light model is how it grows and is easier to understand. Of course, we quickly also talk about other types of models as well, and we have them in our laboratory. But right now, the mini kit's focusing on the traffic light. Uh, ultimately, you know, when you're trying to defend uh, an environment, or we've had some people in our in our courseware that are also looking potentially more at red uh, type of activities, maybe looking at, at understanding at least more red. Uh, you know, a lot of it is yes, you need to learn individually, but you also need to learn as a team. You know, you need to learn as a team to defend. You need to learn individually how to defend, but you only have a very finite skill set in what you do, and the team is going to have a collective of skill sets to go and actively defend the environment. So we call this a breakaway laboratory, uh, where we allow you to either work individually or work collectively. Now, this, this session that we're stepping through now is very individual in nature, but you know, I absolutely would encourage you to you know, talk to some of your peers, colleagues, to, to see how you can expand with them and just know their capabilities. When we get to Section 5, uh, that's where we start talking about uh, a team-based approach and being able to defend an environment from active attacks and inventorying skill sets of your colleagues to be able to do that. Uh, you know, it's not the time to do that while you're under attack. 
hey, who's our Windows guy, right? Who who understands database? Uh, who knows the configuration of this environment? Who knows where the configuration files are actually at? You know, while you're under attack or while you're in an emergency situation, that's not one you want to try to be trying to find that information. So we'll we'll discuss that team approach uh, again in section five. So where did where did all this come from? You know, my background individually uh, in industrial engineering from the University of Illinois, you know, that was a, a great start, but I quickly left that field uh, at the time and got drafted into Argonne National Lab and doing some cybersecurity work there. So while I was there, uh, built out a, a laboratory environment at the lab uh, to, uh, to manage routing and switching and system design. Uh, and at that point, uh, got a little bit more accustomed to hands-on training, true hands-on training, as well as how to design uh, that type of laboratory environment. I've been a long-time instructor you know, for different institutions for, for quite a while, but where I really got drawn back into uh, cyber-physical systems and didn't really realize what I was doing, but uh, you know, here I was out in the middle of the, des the desert uh, here in the U.S. and was just asked to take a wireless directional antenna and just see, hey, can you find any unprotected data child love and wireless networks in this direction, and then I go, can you find it in this direction? And then, of course, I'm like, oh, yeah, I see some there, and this isn't good. They're not even protected at all. And little did I know that I was actually finding these electrical substations that had unprotected wireless networks and that you know, they were accessible using DMP3 protocols back then that somebody could really have done some nasty things with. And also, little did I know that some of those nasty things were being discovered on some Al-Qaeda laptops, and that's how I got drafted into that in the first place. So. Go next to the next year uh, again, just uh, purely circumstantial. I was asked to take a look at some different control centers. You know, control centers being the things that can essentially control multiple uh, control rooms and control processes. But uh, a owner operator was interested in figuring out how can I take two control centers and protect their data communications in an encrypted link, and and that basically ended up being my ICS cybersecurity conversion year. Uh, and I started a consulting company dealing with the NERC SIP cybersecurity standards for the electric sector in the U.S. and part of Canada and a little slice of Mexico. And, and then ever since then, I've been I tipped over into this. Started looking at other control environments in 2007 through 2010. And then, as I had said earlier, sold off Ankari and started Saibadi here to try to focus a bit more on you know, how do we build on these hands-on environments. And that's where things have been pretty amazing and just working with a lot of really smart people uh, in the course uh, to learn from them and how we've refined the course really over the past four or five years. And, and, and the number of, of awesome individuals that have found new vulnerabilities in the platforms we have in the course to recommending certain types of content we should be adding into the material. It really has been you know, phenomenal and uh, I'm really excited to be able to share all of that with everybody through this class. So that moves to the mini kit. Uh, the kit itself, you know, once you get it all built out, uh, that how to build it and the design for it's all in laboratory one, so it's all in your workbook. Uh, even opening up the box and going through each item, and then even figuring out how to close the cases, it's all inside laboratory one and how to manage it. Uh, it's designed to be fully powered uh, by your laptop that you're using across one USB port. Uh, the SIPIDIWORKS virtual machine uh, works inside VMware. We've had participants use uh, VMware running on Windows and on the Mac operating systems. So we've, we've also had some participants that uh, uh, want to use VirtualBox, and that's fine as well. You just point it at the VMDK file, and you can go and use VirtualBox instead of VMware. Uh, the VMware distribution that you have on the USB flash drive that came with the kits uh, does not have an Ethernet port uh, associated with it, an ether a virtualized Ethernet adapter associated with it. Uh, we do not expect there to be a, any, even an Ethernet port being on your host workstation. So we, we have everything going through this USB Ethernet adapter that you associate directly with the virtual machine. Uh, there's lots of reasons we do that, but the primary one was uh, we want to be able to have native protocols going across here that don't use the VMware virtual switch. Uh, we've run into issues uh, where it's caused some problems inside of some of the packet captures as well as just some strange behavior that we don't want that to be part of our educational session. We want it to be more native. So we associate this USB adapter directly with your virtual machine and then the ETH0 interface shows up inside the Sivata Works VM uh, that's on the USB flash drive. 
Uh, you power to get out that same USB port. I think there's a retractable Ethernet adapter inside the kits. And then we use the Raspberry Pi as basically our uh, shape-shifting logic controller. It has a lot of other features in it, uh, but it serves as our programmable logic controller in this case. And the GPIO pins, the ribbon cable that's connected to this, they're called the general purpose input-output pins, connect up the printed circuit board that has all of our I.O. Uh, that we're managing. And in this case, uh, the little traffic lights just connect right to it and that allows us to have our intersection uh, that gives us our physical environment that then is being programmatically controlled by the Raspberry Pi that then can be supervisory controlled uh, by the Sumatra Works Virtual Machine uh, using the integrated OPC server, object linking embedding for process control OPC, and HMI, human machine interface. So all of that, uh, that last part of that is all built inside the VM already. Now if I just threw out a bunch of acronyms and some details that you're not well um, uh, educated in, well, you'll learn all about that in the first couple of labs very quickly, uh, as well as in uh, lab one and two, where you'll be building out your full control environment. Uh, in lab one, we have you build the kits, and then we have you use a wizard uh, that's on the desktop uh, to set up the traffic light very quickly, as well as do a man-in-the-middle attack uh, to blind the operator to the control signaling. We show that to you very quickly, but then, of course, we have you rebuild that environment uh, and then perform that man in the middle attack a little bit you know, in later exercises in a later section because it, it is a little bit more advanced in what it's doing. But there's a lot of wizards that are inside the VM to be able to help establish uh, these quick environments so you don't have to be spending a lot of time just resetting everything and, uh, and trying to figure out how things work over and over again. Uh, you learn it and then you can go ahead and use a wizard to set things up in the future. So the other thing that's neat about the mini kit is it all fits inside that little Plano case, that little uh, case that came with it. Once you build it, uh, you really only have to unplug the USB and Ethernet cable. The ribbon cable and the Pi and everything else just stay connected, and you can fold that back up, and it fits inside that case, uh, and you can carry it around uh, very easy inside of a, easily inside of a bag, uh, a small bag. The goals of this course, you know, ultimately, you know, again, we've had quite a few people that have been in here. Uh, with backgrounds dealing with cyber operational and physical security. So, you know, we traditionally get uh, our largest number of participants that have an IT background wanting to learn more about operational technology. But we've had a lot of people that are operational technology that want to understand cybersecurity to go along with it. We've also had physical security participants in the course that want to understand you know, what their role is in trying to protect the environment, which all of these come together to be able to sufficiently protect uh, what we're doing within our critical infrastructure and control systems that span these large geographic areas. Um, ultimately, we're trying to use laboratories and missions and these kind of models to help you understand the risks through build, break, and secure. And that is what is repeated over and over uh, within the platform and within the laboratories of what we're educating with. So how do you gain access to those online lectures? Well, everybody should have received an email yesterday uh, that was uh, letting you know uh, any tracking details for uh, any material that was sent to you, as well as the link to the uh, on-demand uh, lectures that are available. In the workbook, in section one, uh, the labs we have available for you uh, begin just with setting up, you know, literally everything that's in your kits, introducing everything that's in there, getting your IP connectivity up and working, knowing the IP address architecture of your control environment, um, doing some initial logic, making sure everything works. Uh, if you were missing anything in the kits or anything failed, we can get something shipped back out to you. I mean, all of that is inside that laboratory one and being able to manage it. Uh, and then we also, of course, end it with that man in the middle. In laboratory two, uh, that you're going to be doing uh, in section one, you know, we, we have you build a, a little control environment. And we start with uh, some simulated ladder logic that's inside the virtual machine that you have uh, that we run with and a, an HMI that we've designed. And then we quickly flip things over and allow you to build. You know, how is that HMI designed? And how are these points architected? And what is this control signaling? And how does that work? And what's a scan rate? And, and, and what, you know, how do you interface with these devices? And you'll see that we've, you know, we've taken captures from, some, from our industrial edition kit, some real devices and real controllers, and included it in the laboratories. You know, so for instance, we, you know, we do a serial capture of how authentication occurs with an industrial device, and we did that capture from a piece of real industrial equipment. Or we have you do a device level vulnerability assessment uh, using your platform. We also already have the device level vulnerability assessments from 
a couple of other industrial controllers included inside of the OpenBAS tool that you use. We don't use NESTs because of the licensing constraints, but ultimately it doesn't really matter anyway. We only share with you the tool such as uh, OpenBAS to really show you the, the lack of visibility of the tool. Uh, you know, quite commonly we've gotten so focused on using uh, uh, tools, technology, software to find our vulnerabilities for us, you know, really since the early 2000s with Internet Security Systems came out with that type of scanner, we've moved to a model of just using that automated approach. Well, the reality is most of the vulnerabilities for our control devices are not included inside those applications or they're, mis they're misrepresented. So, of course, we give you the advice to use those tools in conjunction with the manual process that we discuss, uh, you know, in later labs. So, you know, you have that as a laboratory. We also now have our new uh, black box laboratory. Um, you know, we step you through the whole concept, really, of, hey, discover this network. And, and we do that using some pretty neat things uh, with software-defined networking. We've built into the, your platform you're going to be using, you know, industrial protocols already and, and device simulators and all sorts of really neat things in there for you to be able to have, you know, a, a much larger network than just a Raspberry Pi, but also some what looks a little bit more legitimate in what you may have in your control operations and how you're going to have to do discovery. So, you know, we've, we've achieved some pretty neat things in there, and I think you're going to enjoy that black box laboratory and how it works. You'll then get into uh, looking even a little bit at host OS analysis and, and IT ICS application analysis when we get into section three. Um, in that section, uh, we we step you through looking at the Rextraw engineering application, which really using a process for any engineering application. We do the same thing for the HMI and OPC server and how they're configured, uh, and then we let you loose uh, with uh, the virtual machine captures of our industrial edition Windows 7 operating system uh, after it's been exploited a couple different ways. Uh, and there we use a couple tools uh, called uh, Volatility and Yara uh, and, and how they can work and help you review and find you know, some of these traditional operating system vulnerabilities. In section four, uh, we start covering communication protocols and how that man the middle attack work that we did back in section one, as well as some other industrial protocols and how to analyze them. And then ultimately we lead up to section five where we, we do uh, really your, your final mission uh, in this active defense scenario that you're going to go through uh, using the black box network that you stepped through as well as the skills uh, that you garnered over the past uh, few weeks and we talk about some of those active defense capabilities. So all those labs are contained within the workbook. So the course book has all the slides for the online lectures. So you can step through, have this course book with you, and as you're going through the online material, you can take notes in it uh, and use this to help you with any of the labs you're going to be doing. Uh, the, the, each one of the uh, online lectures are broken down by section, and they're all in order. So you can just go through Vimeo and just pick section by section wherever you last left off. And Vimeo keeps track of where you were in each one of those recordings and which ones you've completed, which ones you haven't. So then you'll know where you're at and you just go and follow the course book. Uh, the slide numbers match up with the actual slide numbers within the training and everything else. You'll know where you're at, you know where you left off. But those, the course book itself matches up with those online lectures that you're watching through Vimeo. So I'm running my virtual machine inside of VMware Fusion. Uh, Fusion is the Mac operating system version of VMware. It'll work inside any VMware edition. Um, we've created this virtual machine using the virtual machine profile. So what I have available now is the virtual machine software. I have it fully up and running. And this is our, you know, there are four quick links that are here. Uh, the black box you'll be doing in a later lab as I'm hovering over here in the middle. Uh, but on the left-hand side are the primary areas you're going to be doing throughout the workbook. Click on shortcuts. This gives us access to a lot of the files you're going to be using to complete the labs, whether it's to launch the, in the first lab, uh, the traffic light HMI, or in the second lab, the basic HMI. Uh, we have other quick links in here for in-map uh, in mapping. Of course, we constantly warn about active analysis of environments. You know, be very cautious, only be testing, and generally, of course, we urge you not to do that. But what's interesting about the red point scripts is it has some unique behaviors that we talk about in the labs. From when Digital Bond created these, they emulate engineering workstations and how they operate. But pointedly, there's a lot of great tools in here, and we discuss these tools throughout the laboratories and how to set everything up. There's also several folders. Uh, a lot of the folders we don't delve into, but they're here as really additional features for you to go and explore. Uh, so fundamentals 
you know, we have some cybersecurity flashcards to help with your training if you'd like to be able to uh, go further on a certain topic on, or a certain keywords. Uh, we don't currently have a certification for this course, but we are reviewing that, and that's where these flashcards may become valuable as time continues. Learning more about circuitry design, we talk about that in the course. So I'll leave it to you uh, to go through some of these folders and, and review it and see what's in here. Uh, I just wanted to go through a couple. We cover a, major, a lot of them in the lab, but if you have any questions, just ask during office hours and we'll go into more detail. It is the Wizards folder. So the Wizards folder has in it, uh, you know, you'll be doing this in the first lab using the Minikit Traffic Light Wizard is to set up your traffic light very quickly and have it up and operational. But it also has some standalone wizards that are in here like you do in lab two where I have you assess functional logic. So these, you know, these wizards are set up where you just double click on them and it builds out an entire environment. Now, we talk about this in the lab. This is using software defined networking, so we build a multiple node environment right away. It just launched up the HMI to go with it, and then it actually also is launching a uh, software defined uh, logic controller that has ladder logic built into it. Now, this wizard uh, also takes over the mouse inside this virtual machine, the keyboard, and everything else, and does keystrokes and gets everything set up to make it all work uh, much easier so that I'm not giving the instructions on how to do everything that just happened. So, you know, now I actually have some functional logic up and running. This is ladder logic. We'll learn about that, you know, in your first sets of lectures as well as in the second lab. Uh, you go through this. And this is our quick little Python mob HMI that's truly controlling this process. So, again, you know, if I were to take one of these conditions and make them true, it would actually change the running logic of this here as if it was a real logic controller uh, out there running part of our facility, in this case, running a motor. So you do this in the lab. I talk about it in the lecture. We talk about it in the lab. But I just wanted to show you how these wizards work. And they're completely resettable. So if you hit the X button, it shuts it all down. And if I want to go ahead and restart this again, boom, right, I'm running the control environment again. And, and you can see that you know, we're emulating a lot of different devices there on the back end. Uh, it's outside the scope of this first lecture for me to be covering that, but you can see there's firewalls, there's switches, there's routers, there's multiple hosts. Uh, using software-defined networking, we're building out that entire topology on the back plane uh, so that we can have your virtual machine, so we can truly give you a control environment that you're assessing with real protocols and lots of systems that are there so we can do some really neat things. So you'll see that in the lab, but this is just an example of how some of the wizards work, and you're doing this right away in lab two. Um, so we'll shut that guy down and we'll close this window. Um, a couple of the other wizards, again, as I said, you know, we're trying to have this be an educational research platform, uh, not just for, for ICS like you have for this course, but what if there's some other things that you have to deal with some traditional IT vulnerabilities? A lot of ICS devices uh, are also vulnerable to several typical IT vulnerabilities, uh, and a lot of that, you know, as we've taken these ICS devices and webified them, you know, adding web applications to them, a lot of those vulnerabilities trickled over to the ICS environment. So if you're not familiar with the Open Web Application Security Project or uh, those vulnerabilities, we include a wizard just for you to go and review it. It's outside the course content. There's plenty of training you can go and do for web application security. Maybe you're not even interested. Maybe you have somebody else in your team that is interested. Again, we don't have the course content to support it, but what we have done is taken somebody else's wizard that they've already provided, made it open source, and scripted it and made it easy to work with. Some utility was created by Adrian Crenshaw, and it uses the Open Web Application Security Project's portal set of vulnerabilities and steps you through some pretty neat training to go along with it. So we built a wizard to go and support that. You know, the, uh, a uh, educational institution down in Brazil, they developed a wizard to be able to do some IP routing uh, laboratory examples and configuration. So we wrote a wizard around that. So you'll just see some other wizards that are in here. We cover most of these in the courseware, but again, if you have questions, feel free to ask because some of them are outside the scope of what we're trying to cover with industrial applications. But in scope, because industrial applications use routing protocols, and so it is part of the attack surface as well as some of the defensive requirements you have to put in place. So that's why we still have to include it, or it's worthwhile to include it. It's just there's plenty of training already out there to manage it. You can also see we have an industrial protocol generator. You know, this really shows some of the capabilities of the platform using some of the integrated libraries that are in there. We integrate these protocols inside of some of our scenarios, but these are some quick wizards that you can use if you want to see how these protocols work. Tie them with Wireshark. We'll talk about this in section four when we get into communications. 
why we look at some of these wizards. The other great resource we have in here is the search engine. So if you just double click on the search engine, basically uh, there is 10 years of collected documents uh, that either myself or past participants in the course have recommended putting into this virtual machine, and we've made them queryable. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Lou Folkerth, a uh, past participant of the class, ended up using the Industrial Edition to develop a forensics white paper. So, you know, if you were to just take them and put in his name, uh, if I can type it correctly, you can find his document in here, Forensics Analysis of Industrial Control Systems. You open that up. And you can go ahead and read, you know, this forensics process that was put in place, his discussion using our industrial edition kit, uh, as well as what he then gave as examples of how to start doing forensics, uh, communications, as well as some device level forensics to the device, uh, certain types of attacks that he did against the hardware. So, pretty interesting paper as you take a look at it. You know, we, we use this tool and the search engine to inventory manuals. All right, so I talked about Yara as a signature tool. All right, if you want to go ahead and get this cheat sheet for using Yara, we'll be talking about this in section three. You can see that very quickly. You know, so it's already in here to use it. Or what if you want to use a manual for volatility? Again, that's available uh, in here to be able to go in and do that. So uh, again, actually that was cheat sheet I opened up there was for volatility the first time. The Yara manual. There it is. So we have the whole YAR rule manual in here as well, but we have that for a number of applications and devices. And what if you're interested in learning more about Stuxnet? You know, so you can go and look up some of the white papers that are associated with that. Or what if you're interested specifically in Havix? And we take you straight to you know the Havix attacks and some of the information from that specific uh, keyword. So this is all within the courseware. You know, we discuss how to use this tool. We give you references where we may say, hey, go back to the search engine and type in a certain string. And that's what we're wanting to do to be able to go and find the documents already populated within the virtual machine uh, for you to be able to do some additional reading if you need help on a certain concept or topic. Uh, so you know, even taking a look at the Raspberry Pi and its schematic is in here. So, you know, there's all sorts of details, such as this first one. The Raspberry Pi is on a death flash. So when the Raspberry Pi 2 first came out, it was vulnerable to a smartphone Xenon flash bulb. So you would take a picture of it, and the system would then just reboot. Uh, there was a chip that was labeled the U16 chip that whenever this flash from a camera the Xenon bulb that was on the smartphones would go off. It would take a few electrons and it would go flying off that chip and it would go into an under voltage scenario and actually shut down the entire Raspberry Pi. Now I wasn't necessarily smart enough to figure all that out, but that's where this document goes back to a physicist that was smart enough to figure that out and shared his information about how that all worked. You know, so it, it basically then talks about you know the need to be able to do physical device security around them, which they ultimately did. They re-engineered re the Raspberry Pi and put a little bit of a laminate on top of that U16 chip so that it was protected from that flash. They changed the design uh, to go with it. We can see here, you know, we even include schematics, device level schematics. Not that you're going to be doing this, but it's just being aware that hopefully your vendor is, if you're procuring equipment, that they make sure that the devices that are being manufactured match their initial schematics uh, that they put in place. You know, and that's part of your supply chain awareness you want to be managing. But again, we cover that within the courseware.